Well, good morning. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We are currently going through the Psalms. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to Psalm 45. And it's really an interesting Psalm. Uh, this was written, of course, uh, in the Old Testament and many years ago. And it's actually talking about the Messiah, Christ, the King, coming for his bride. I titled the message, Christ Returning for His Bride. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for just this opportunity you've given us to, <clears throat> to study your word, Lord. Father, I just pray that as we get into your word that... Uh, <laughs> that you would touch my body, Lord, uh, just dealing with this sore throat and my chest and the strong steroids that the doctor gave me today, Lord. I, I just pray, Father, that you would help me to make it through, that you would bless and anoint the teaching of your word, God. And Father, what a privilege it is to have fellowship with you through your word, Lord. Go before us, bless our time, in Jesus' name we ask, <clears throat> amen. <clears throat> to the chief musician, set to the lilies, a contemplation of the sons of Korah, a song of love. Look at verse one. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty, ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness and is a scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces <clears throat> by which they have made you glad. <clears throat> King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold up from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. So the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord, worship him. And the daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. <clears throat> the rich among the people will seek your favor. The royal daughter is all glorious within the palace. Her clothing is woven with gold. She shall be brought to the king in robes of many colors. The virgins, <clears throat> her companions who follow her, shall be brought to you. With gladness and rejoicing, they shall be brought. They shall enter the king's palace. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. <clears throat> Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. Well, of course, Psalm 45 is a composition prepared for a royal wedding. But at the same time, it's also a messianic psalm. The words, O oh God, in verse 6, and in Hebrews 1, verses 6 to 7, <coughs> give reference to Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know which earthly king and bride it was originally written about. Some say it could have been Solomon, one of his brides. <clears throat> Others have a lot of different things they go out there with. So we don't really know. 
but it was originally written about a king and his bride. Now we're to assume the author is writing of a specific Jewish king <clears throat> whose identity at this time is not known. And at the same time, he's looking ahead to the promised king whose eternal reign was foreshadowed by the Jewish monarchy. Here's what we need to keep in mind. A number of the Psalms do have Messianic elements, even though they're not in themselves fully Messianic. <clears throat> Psalm 8 and Psalm 40 have parts that are applied to Jesus in the book of Hebrews. The point is the Psalms also have other meanings. Psalm 45 begins with an introduction in verse 1. <clears throat> We see it having a conclusion in verses 16 to 17, where the author is speaking. Now in verses 2 to 15, it's speaking to the groom and to the bride. It goes back to ancient betrothal and wedding customs. The very first step leading to a wedding was a betrothal. Now the betrothal was a former act. It was usually arranged by the parents of the future bride and the future groom. Most of the time, <clears throat> the parents would sit down and talk about it with their children. Now, betrothal meant more than what engagement means today. It was a legal procedure done before witnesses, and it was confirmed by oaths taken by the couple. It was such a big deal that the couple could be called husband and wife. You could actually do that. <clears throat> Even though there, there was never that physical union that made them one. This was the deal with Joseph and Mary when Jesus was conceived. In fact, it was such a big deal. Think about this it would require something like a divorce to literally break that union. <clears throat> Another part of the betrothal was a commitment on the part of the husband's family. They had to provide a dowry that would establish standards of good and proper behavior, the age of the couple, which would mean a long delay between the betrothal and the wedding. And when the day of the wedding finally came, the friends of the bride gathered at the bride's home where she prepared herself to look her best, put the best everything on. At the same time, those of the groom would gather at his house. There would then be a grand procession through the streets of the city. The groom and those who were with him were going to get the bride. It was followed by a, a second procession of the entire party. <clears throat> Both the bride and the groom, the entourage from the bride's home back to the groom's home. Does that ring any bells? The rapture of the church? Christ coming for his bride and taking us home. <clears throat> At the groom's home, there would be a joyful wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It could last as long as one or two weeks, depending on the status and the wealth of the groom's family. Jesus' parable about the five wise and the five foolish virgins kind of has this setting of a returning procession and feast. So here in verses two to nine, the king is coming for his bride. In verses 10 to 12, <coughs> advice is being given to the bride as she waits for her bridegroom. In verses 13 to 15, <coughs> the bride is led out to the king. 
And then that procession makes its way to his home. And the wedding party enters the palace. The final verses are personal blessings on the marriage and its union. Something else we see here in verse 1. A special introduction is given because the author tells how this has stirred his emotions. <clears throat> it would have been a moving challenge if the wedding was only of an earthly king and bride. But as we read here, it's also a picture of the heavenly wedding <laughs> where the groom, Jesus Christ, takes the church, his bride, to himself. As we come to verses two to nine, it begins with praise of the divine king and the bridegroom, the king being Jesus Christ. We catch this as the king of this wedding is called fairer than the sons of men. <clears throat> now, some scholars note in the ancient world, the main praiseworthy characteristics of a king were physical attractiveness and the gracious words that, of course, he would then speak. But praiseworthy attributes of just being physically attractive would kind of be on the low end of God's scale. <clears throat> it would be under things like truth, humility, righteousness, what we see here mentioned in verse four. Jesus has these characteristics in a degree to where no one else could ever come close. When Jesus was on the earth, he spoke with such authority that when his enemies sent soldiers to arrest him, the soldiers returned saying in John chapter seven, verse 46, no man ever spoke like this man. On one occasion, when the people were walking away from Jesus, <clears throat> he challenged the 12, the 12 disciples, asking if they wanted also to leave. We read in John 6, verse 68, but Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, it's clear in the scriptures, when Jesus was on earth, his words had power to still the storm, to cast out demons from those who were possessed, to restrain his enemies, and to draw men and women who were trapped by sin to faith in himself. Jesus had victories throughout his life, and you know what? He still does today. <clears throat> they were victories won on truth, humility, and righteousness. If you look at it from a physical point of view, Jesus' enemies were victorious because they succeeded in having him condemned and executed. But in terms of truth, Humility, righteousness, Jesus won. He won. He upheld these characteristics in his person and in his conduct. Everything he said and did, even when he was treated unjustly. That should reveal to us <clears throat> that our victories come in the same way. We don't win by force. We don't win by pushing things down people's throats. <clears throat> you see, whenever the church gives in to using force as a way of teaching Christian truths or values, what happens is the church loses its spiritual battle. It loses its spiritual battle. It becomes just like the world. I mean, what's the difference? 
we end up taking on the way the very evils that we're so supposed to be making a stand against. You see, the only sword that we are to use is the truth of God's word. Remember what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 6, 17? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verses eight to nine turn from the personal qualities and actually the, the military victories of the king, speaking of Jesus, to the wedding, which is what the psalm is all about. Notice verse six. <clears throat> it addresses the bridegroom of this wedding as God. <laughs> it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You go right into the next verse, verse seven. It speaks of the groom being a man again. Look what it says. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Now, this is shown in the ancient versions, the Hebrew and the New Testament, <clears throat> as taken verses six and seven to mean and apply to Jesus. Hebrews chapter one, verses eight and nine. But to the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. <clears throat> Therefore, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. You see, you just can't understand these two verses together unless they're understood to refer to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I mean, he's the only one that can be called God. And at the same time, have the Father as his God, <laughs> because he's the Son. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, these verses are translated, so even the ancient Jewish translators regarded these words as referring to the Messiah. So while the groom is on his way to the bride's house. The bride is waiting in joyful expectancy. She's probably biting her nails. <laughs> Can't believe it's getting ready to happen. It's a picture of the church. But you know what's interesting? There's some anxiety because when the groom arrives, think about this. The bride is going to be leaving her family and her home forever. That's why in verses 10 to 12, the writer turns to the bride in a fatherly way to reassure her that the future is going to be awesome. And then not worry about those she's leaving behind. First, he says, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house. You see where the priority is here? <clears throat> we all love our family. We all love our kids and grandkids. What did God tell Abraham in Genesis 12, 1? Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. Well, here in verse 10, we have the same thing. <clears throat> Forget your own people also in your father's house. I mean, it, it sounds harsh. And yet, this is what we Christians are called on to do. Jesus said something in Luke 14, Verse 26, 
It was really difficult for me to understand when I first read it. He said, if anyone wants to come to me <clears throat> and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So what kind of point was Jesus making there? He was making this point. No human relationships can be allowed to restrain us from following Jesus with all of our heart if we're going to be his. If we're going to be his. <clears throat> you see, in marriage, we read in Genesis 2, verse 24, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In other words, if we're going to be Christ's bride, I mean, this is the picture here. We have to leave all other loyalties behind. There's no, uh, you can't debate that. That's just the way it is. One day we're going to look back on parting from these temporary things. And you know what? We're going to think it was really stupid <laughs> to have tripped out over it all. <clears throat> think about this. When we sit in the kingdom of God, clothed in the gold of Ophir, at the right hand of the eternal king, we will wonder how we could have put so much emphasis on what we saw and had in the former things. You know what, guys? I'm here to tell you this morning, we will never regret it, ever, because of who our Lord is and what he's got prepared for us, what he's done for us. The writer counsels the bride to worship your Lord. Literally, it means to bow down. I mean, this is a holy relationship with the love of the bridegroom for his bride <clears throat> and the reverence of the bride for the groom. It follows right along with what Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 33 of the relationship with the husband and the wife. <clears throat> in the last word of advice for the bride, the author is telling her, to look to what the future holds for her as the bride of this great king. <laughs> it's knowing that her choice of him was the best thing she could have ever done. Wait till we get to heaven. Wait till we get to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, to, to know the time that we are living in now, it's just, it's exciting, man. Here the psalmist sees three things in her future. First, the love of her king, verse 11. Second, the honor that will be given her because of her relationship to him, verse 12. Third, joy and gladness that will be hers with him for all eternity. I mean, you get in this picture here of what it's going to be like. <clears throat> this is why we're looking for Christ to come. We're looking for the rapture to happen, the imminence of Christ's return. It's a biblical doctrine. They've been looking for Christ to come for 2,000 years. But there was major prophecies that had to put the church in that generation that would witness his return. And here we are. We're all set. It's ready to go. It will be this generation. After he advises the bride to look ahead, the author looks ahead by going back to the description of the wedding procession. In verses 13 to 15, <clears throat> he describes the bride being led out to the king and going with him with all 
who are attending the feast. They're going back to the king's palace where they enter with excitement and rejoicing. <laughs> Made me think of the Apostle Paul. He wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, but as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. <clears throat> we don't have a clue, but all I can say is when we get there, we are going to be blown away. Verse 16, the psalmist looks to the king and offers something like a benediction or a blessing on the marriage. He says, instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. You know what's kind of amazing? <clears throat> in thinking of the Messiah, it must refer to the many sons who will be brought into glory as a result of this union. Hebrews 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, speaking of Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory, <clears throat> to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He then finishes with saying in verse 17, I will make your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, the people shall praise you forever and ever. You know, it causes reflection on what the psalmist is saying here. I mean, think about it. Are we praising him who has purchased us, us to himself to be his bride? Are we praising the Lord? Are we working to see that the nations come to honor him? Are we being those witnesses? Even more than that, are we waiting for his return? As the bride of Psalm 45 is. You know, sometimes we can get so caught up in this life that we're not even thinking about it. Jesus could come at any moment. You see, Jesus came the first time to join us to himself in a spiritual betrothal. Guys, he's coming a second time <laughs> to take us to himself. And we're going to be with him forever and ever, man. Everything that we're dealing with, even right now, this is all going to pass. It will all pass. But I just want to re-emphasize are we ready for his return? Are we truly looking forward to it? It's where you have to examine your heart. Self-examination comes in. You see, as Christians, we're described in what we should be like in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. <clears throat> Listen to what Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's a reference to the seven-year tribulation period. Even Jesus, who delivers us, come on, church, from the wrath to come. Jesus clearly specified in John 14, verses 2 and 3. <clears throat> he said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm not going to lie to you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare that place for you, 
I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's been preparing that place for 2,000 years. Come on. I mean, Jesus spoke everything we see here in our universe. God spoke it all into existence in six days and rested on the seventh. Here, Jesus has been preparing this place for us for 2,000 years. Can you even imagine what it's like? When you get to the end of the book of Revelation, <clears throat> Revelation 22, 20, it says this. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. <laughs> Notice the right reply from the church. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So let it be. Amen. We got a lot to be excited about, man. <clears throat> Everything that's going on now, it's all going to pass. We're going to be with the Lord very soon. Guys, we got to be ready. We got to be watching. We have to be prepared. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this time, Lord. Uh, Father, I thank you for helping me to be able to get through this. <clears throat> I pray you continue to touch my body and bring healing to it. I pray for Stephanie, my wife, for her body, Lord, to bring healing to it. And uh, God, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. We thank you through our union with you. As a born-again believer, we become your sons and daughters. God, that we are a part of your family. How awesome is that? Lord, I pray you would bless the rest of this day, bless this week as we lift it to you, God. And Lord, we just want to thank you again for your leading, your guiding, and for the work that you're doing in our lives, the work that you're still yet going to do. Go before us, Father, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. amen. I love you guys. Lord willing. See you Wednesday night as we continue in our studies. The Gospel of Matthew. And we're getting close to wrapping up the Sermon of the Mount. Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> I will see you there or be square. <laughs> I know I'm old. What can I say? I love it. Hopefully I'll see you in the air. Either way, let's do it for his glory and his kingdom. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys.